morning church. Amen. Lloyd. Where are you, Lloyd? Um, please come forward, Lloyd. Lloyd is a very good friend of mine. Uh, he's coming, you will see him. Um, I'd like to thank God for this opportunity. Thank the church for the opportunity to share God's word with the saints. Before I start, I asked Lloyd to sing a song. It's in Tijewa. I hope you don't mind. And let's listen to it. Oh. 
because we are a small oil trader before we open the oil, which brings us the world of righteousness. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you open our hearts in this moment, as your spirit may move, starting from its purpose to the peace. And that Lord, we may all experience your presence, we may experience your word changing our lives in this moment. Thank you for your faithfulness and thank you for answering this prayer. For the first is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Um, today has been an interesting day for me. Um, so, for starters, I did not know what was in the quarterly lesson. I did not have the time to study. But when I was on the class listening to the lesson, it was very interesting because the center of what was being discussed in this week's lesson is in some ways, not in some ways, in many ways, the center of today's sermon. And then when, is it, I think, um, Ella was singing um, the, the main song, The King is Coming. Again, the central theme of that song, in some ways, also comes, you know, it, it comes together with the sermon. You know, when preachers stand and say, the, same, the song that has just been sung has the same, I always thought they, they just make these things up, but uh, I have seen that and I think it's just God uh, trying to speak to us all uh, in a special way uh, this morning. Um, the title of my sermon, as um, James already said, is OE of Little Faith. Now, I don't know, how many of you know Randy Ski? Just raise your hands if you know Randy Skeet. He's a very powerful preacher, I'm sure most of us know him. When Randy stands, uh, usually when he's about to start, for those of you who know him, he says, I have three things that I would like to ask of you. You know that, right? So he asks the people to pray for him, and then he asks them to turn off their phones, and then he asks them something, the third thing. What's the third thing that he asks? Yeah, so that's, he says, God to put words. So that's the second thing. What he says is, you should pray that God should put his words uh, in. Let me ask something else. What's the third thing? Who knows? Think. Think, yes. He asks the people to think. I'm not going to ask you to do the first two things. If you, if you want, you can do them. But I'll ask specifically for this message. Let me just take on what we call it, our thinking cups. Eh? Let's just put on our thinking caps for this next 30 or 40 minutes. I want us to think. We're going to use a lot of inference in our sermon. So we're going to take a little phrase from this part of the sermon of the Bible and try to apply it. So if you're not thinking, I'm going to lose you. You're not going to understand what we're trying to present. So I need you to, just for this next 30 or 40 minutes, use your mind. Just think, uh, reason. The Bible says, come and let us reason together. So let's reason. Okay? Is that too much for us? The church is silent. Is that too much? <laughs> is thinking too much to ask from the people of God? Okay, thank you. So let's turn our Bibles to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is a very, if we have never spent time in the book of Revelation, I would encourage you to do so. Just spend some time in reading even the entire book and studying and understanding it. It's a very interesting book. Um, when you get to the book of Revelation and in the chapters 13 and 14, um, in many ways, I like to think that those two chapters are the climax of the book. Um, the entire book of Revelation, uh, you can think of it as there's a struggle that is going on in the book of Revelation. God, on one side, wants his people 
to worship him and to give him glory. And we see that in, the, um, in, in chapter 14, uh, verse 6, where, um, where God is saying through the, through, uh, through the three angels' messages that uh, worship me and give me glory. On the other side, uh, in chapter 13, uh, we find a beast uh, who has an image and has, um, has a mark and uh, he is forcing people to worship him. So you find that on the one side there's a power, there's a structure uh, which is being represented by this beast that is forcing people to worship him uh, through whatever means that he sees right. And on the other hand in chapter 14 we're seeing God asking people to worship him. Make sense? So in many ways, the struggle that is being presented in, uh, in Revelation 14, uh, in the book of Revelation, comes to a climax in these two chapters. It's very uh, interesting uh, passages to spend time in. Um, but what I want us to really focus on this morning is, in chapter 14, as I say, the three angels' messages from verse 6 start. And as you go down, just as... Um, the three, the three angels' messages have been presented in verse 12. There's a very interesting uh, verse that I'm going to spend some time in this morning. So, the verse says, verse 12 of chapter 14, Revelation. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have or oh, and the faith of Jesus. So, as this struggle that is that I just described, Satan is forcing people, and the rest, uh, chapter 13 says the whole world wander after the beast, right? In the midst of all this, God says, but there is a group of people, and he describes them, and he's saying these people, they have certain characteristics. The first thing that God says is that here is the patience of the saints. These people have what? Patience. Now, why do they need patience? Because if you understand what is happening, and again, I really, really encourage you to study the book or maybe even just this chapter. If you understand what is happening, these people need patience to be able to go through. Remember, the beast is trying to force everyone to worship. So they need the patience to be able to go through what the beast is uh, pretty much forcing them to do, to be able to restrain them to perseverance, to, for, for them to be able to persevere through what the beast is trying to, uh, is, is making them go through, they need patience. So that's the first thing, they're patient people. The second thing is that they're saints. Saints, what does the word saint, for you, what does that mean, for you to be a saint? If you're a saint, you're what? Remember, we're thinking today, right? So, if you're a saint, what are you? You're righteous. What's the other way? Holy. If you're a saint, are you holy? The Bible says, be you ye holy as what? As your Father in heaven is holy, right? Or righteous. Holiness, righteousness, that's the same thing, right? That's the character of God. Righteousness. God is holy. So, this group of people are holy. They are righteous. Okay. Make sense? The third, the third thing that we find is that they keep the commandments of God. Now, you just say that these people are holy and they are righteous. The commandments of God are an expression of God's character. Right? So if these people are holy, they cannot be holy if they are not expressing God's character through the keeping of his commandments. Make sense? The fourth and last character or characteristic that is presented here is that they have the faith of Jesus. Now, <clears throat> I'm sure we've all gone to, if you're understanding me now, I'm speaking English, that means we've all gone to some school that taught us English, or at least we've learned English. We understand what 
we have command over the language, right? Now, I'm going to ask a question, uh, an English quest related, language related question. What is the difference between, these people have the faith of Jesus, right? What is the difference between having the faith of Jesus and having faith in Jesus? Is there a difference? Yes. Yeah. There is? Yeah. Okay. What's the difference? The faith of Jesus, you, you show, we do, we do exactly how Jesus' faith mm -hmm. is. Yes. The faith in Jesus is now trusting in Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. Have we gotten what you say? Faith. Okay, the faith of Jesus, what he says is the faith of Jesus is pretty much having the faith that Jesus has. Faith in Jesus is having faith or trusting in Jesus, right? In the power of Jesus. Make sense? So, okay, these people are said to have the faith, at least in my Bible, okay, I don't know what your Bibles are saying, but in my Bible it says they have the faith of Jesus. Now, <laughs> I was asking myself, how does someone end up to have someone else's faith? Does that make sense? Does that question make sense? Because what this is saying is that these people have the same faith that Jesus Christ had or has. If he still has it, I'm sure he does. So whatever faith Jesus shows to, I'm sure, God the Father, this group, this group of people show that same faith. So I asked myself, how does someone end up to have or to express someone else? Should we not all have our own faith? How do you end up expressing someone else's faith? And that's pretty much the question that we're going to try to answer uh, this morning. So to answer that question, Go with me to the book, the same book, Revelation. We're going to spend quite some time in the book of Revelation. Uh, the same book, chapter 10. In the book of Revelation, again, chapter 10, uh, the context of the context of that chapter is what is known as the seven trumpets or the seven angels. So from chapter 8, verse 6, if you just go to chapter 8, verse 6, uh, that's where the context pretty much starts. Um, and the seven angels, which have the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. So from verse 7, the first trumpet sounds, and then it goes the second trumpet, verse 8, verse 10, the third trumpet, verse 12, the fourth trumpet, and in chapter 9, verse 1, the fifth trumpet, and it goes on in chapter 9, verse 13, you have the sixth trumpet. We're not going to spend time uh, in, the trump in all the trumpets. Um, but just to give you a quick overview of what these trumpets are, that pretty much these angels are announcing different uh, periods of time in history. So different times. Uh, time periods of different events that are happening throughout history. So in the first trumpet, uh, the angel announces uh, the actual message, the prophecy there, it's talking about the fall of Jerusalem. So that's what the, the, the trumpet is for. In the second trumpet, uh, he is, uh, I think that's, the second trumpet is when Rome was invaded by the barbarians um, after the fall of, of, of Jesus. So they are all in chronological, chronological order. The third trumpet is um, the apostasy that creeped into the church when uh, who's that? Constantine uh, turned in, uh, became Christian. And then the fourth trumpet uh, announces the dark ages that followed after Constantine uh, became Christian and then the Roman Catholic Church started to persecute the church. And then the fifth trumpet um, announces the French 
revolution, which ended with the papacy being taken into prison and then um, pretty much the end of the papacy the way that it was before, and I, I think that was 1798. So by the fifth trumpet, I, I really want you to follow me, don't lose me, this is very important. By the fifth trumpet, uh, that's in 1798, the papacy has gone into prison, the French Revolution has ended. And then what's next after the fifth trumpet? Guys, I need you to follow me and I need you to think. What's after five? <laughs> so after five, you have six. So the sixth trumpet only makes sense that it has to come after 1798, right? Right? Okay, I'm going to jump to the sixth trumpet. The seventh trumpet is coming pretty much the seventh trumpet. That's why I was saying that the song that Ada was singing um, is somewhat related to this message. She says, she, she was singing, when she was singing, she was saying, I can hear the trumpet sounding, right? That trumpet that was being said in that song is the seventh trumpet, because the seventh trumpet is sounded at the coming of Christ. So the seventh trumpet is the coming, the second coming of Christ. Does that make sense? So the trumpet that was being sung, that's the seventh trumpet. Now, the sixth trumpet, the fifth trumpet, sorry, 1798. The seventh trumpet, the coming of Christ. If we have not yet gotten to the seventh trumpet, which is the coming of Christ, what time are we in currently? The sixth trumpet, right? Make sense? Does that make sense? The seventh, the fifth was sound in 1798, the Papa said, went to prison in France, in France. The seventh, the coming of Christ. We are in the sixth trumpet. Make sense? Thank you. Now, I wanted you to understand that context before going to chapter 10. When you go to chapter 10 of Revelation, there is a whole story that it's sort of um, in between, because we've just seen in chapter 9, the sixth trumpet. The story there in chapter 10 is between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet. So there's a whole story there. Unfortunately, maybe we are not going to spend too much time to understand every detail of that chapter, which will take us too long. But when you understand the prophecy that is happening there, um, it is describing the time when, uh, again, the other thing that was just interesting for me in the during the day, when the master guides in training were presenting the pioneers, um, what that chapter is describing, it's pretty much describing what these people were presenting in the morning, uh, the time of uh, the Miller Light movement, and everything that occurred uh, leading to 1844, the Great Disappointment. So you find an angel that comes down from heaven, if you read chapter 10, who has a, a book that is open, I'm sure, you understand these prophecies if you have uh, gone through Master Guide and this type of things. Uh, who has an open book, and then John is taught to eat that book, and it is sweet in the mouth, and then it is bitter in the stomach, uh, which just represents the open book being Daniel, and that they understood the messages of the 2300 days, and then when they thought that it was Christ coming, it was sweet, they were happy, but then when, that, when Christ did not come, they were sad, so it was bitter in the stomach. Make sense? So you see that even the chronology of chapter 10 makes sense because 19, uh, 1798 is the year that the, um, the, 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 sixth, uh, sorry, the fifth trumpet sounded, right? And then the 1800s start, and that's when the Mirai movement is starting, 1800s leading to 1844. Okay? Now, as Christ, um, as, as, as the message in chapter 10 is being described. So don't lose me, what the, quest, the question we're trying to answer is how does someone have uh, someone else's faith? In chapter 10, verse, um, verse, sorry, let me just check what verse that is.
I'm going to start from verse 6. And swear by him that lives forever and ever and created heaven, this is the angel, and the things that therein, that therein are, and the earth, and the things that therein are, and the sea, and the things where, uh, which are therein, that there should be time no longer. So the angel prophesies that there will be no longer time. What that means is that beyond 1844, there will be no more time prophecies. And then in verse 7, he says that, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel. Who is this angel? The seventh angel. Is that what is that? The seventh trumpet. So he's describing the seventh trumpet. So he says, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he has declared to his servants the prophets. So he says, in the days that the seventh angel is about to sound, he has not yet sounded, but in the days that he, has, he is about to sound, those are the days, the, this, the days that are being mentioned here are these days. Remember we have established that we are between the sixth and the seventh, right? So the days that are being described here are these days. So he says that the mystery of God should be finished in those days. Another question for you. What is the mystery of God? So as I told you, we are going to try and make a lot of inferences to understand this. So. The mystery of God, for us to understand what the mystery of God, we're going to step away from the book of Revelation and we'll go to the book of um, Colossians. So the book of Colossians chapter 1 will help us understand. And maybe before going to Colossians, let's go to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 3, verse 16. Are you with me so far? Okay. I haven't lost you. Alright, so the book of First Timothy, verse 3, uh, chapter 3, sorry, verse 16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, Justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So, Paul here is describing what he believes is the mystery of godliness. If you understand what Paul is describing there, there's a phrase that we could use, and that's the plan of salvation. Is that true? Like, Look, look with me. He says, God was manifest in the flesh. What, is, what event is that? The incarnation of Christ. The first coming of Christ as a child growing up and then crucified, right? That's God being manifest in the flesh. And then it says, justified in the spirit, sin of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, then received up to glory. Do you see that what Paul is saying there is that the mystery of godliness is the idea that God came from heaven, he came, he lived, and he died, and he went back to heaven. Is that what he's saying? Which is pretty much what we call the plan of salvation, right? Okay, keep that thought, and then let's go to Colossians. So Colossians um, chapter 1 sort of hits uh, the last nail uh, on the coffin. So, if anyone has found it, you could read chapter 1, verse 26 of Colossians. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and for generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. Um, read 27. To them, 
God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Does that make sense? So again, Paul is saying, what is the, at the end of the day, he just hits the nail. The mystery of God is what? According to verse 27, what's the mystery of God? Christ in you and me, the hope of glory. So when chapter 10 of Revelation says, in the days of the seventh angel, when the angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God should be fulfilled in his people. What does he say? If we apply by application, especially this seventh verse. Come on. We're thinking today. So the mystery of God is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What that verse in chapter 10 of uh, Revelation is saying is that before the coming of Christ, there is going to be a people that will have Christ developed in their hearts. Right? Because the mystery of godliness is the idea that God came from heaven and he displayed godliness and he showed us the way to have the same character built in us. So when that character has built in us and it has actually we have we are showing the exact same character that Christ showed when he was on earth. That is a mystery. And why is it a mystery? It's a mystery because this earth as of now is a sin filled world. Uh, eh, well, how on earth can people develop a Christ like character in a, in, in a world like this? Every corner and turn that we turn to, there's sin or it's a reminder of sin in the billboards, in that everywhere. How do you develop a character uh, of, of godliness? It's a mystery. And in the Bible, there are two mysteries, by the way. There's the mystery of iniquity and the mystery of godliness. Do you know what the mystery of iniquity is? It's the opposite, pretty much, of, of what I'm saying here. In heaven, Satan, or who was Lucifer then, they say, uh, you were perfect. Before, uh, before iniquity was, until iniquity was found uh, in your heart. How on earth was uh, iniquity found in Satan's heart? In a perfect world. It's a mystery. So that's, a, that's the mystery of iniquity. The mystery of godliness is the opposite of that. How are we going to develop a character of godliness? But that's what is expected uh, in these days. And that is what God is saying before he comes back, before he, the seventh trumpet, the, before the king comes, as Ella was saying, before the seventh trumpet sounds, his people are to develop a character uh, that reflects him. They are to have Christ in him. Now, if we had the time to understand uh, the context of Revelation 10 even further, we would see that that context actually mirrors the context of um, Revelation chapter 14, the, the three angels messages. The three angels messages if you remember, if you have studied the three angels messages, whether in Master Guide or in your personal time, they were actually, they actually started uh, the first angels message which is uh, Fear God and Give Him God actually started um, with the mirror like movement. So when the, uh, the likes of the mirrors and you know, the other people were studying the other movement. What they were preaching was that the hour of his judgment is come because they believed that uh, after the, the end of the 300 days, God would come back and he would judge his people. So if they were preaching the first angels' messages. And the end, and, and, so when you understand that, you see that the angels, the three angels' messages start around the same time as uh, the sixth angel uh, in, in chapter 10. Now, as the three angels' messages are coming to an end, there is a people that are expected to have what we just described in the very start. Remember, they will have the faith of Jesus. When 
the sixth angel has finished his work, the mystery of God is to be fulfilled. What that is saying is that the mystery of God and the faith of Jesus are actually the same thing. I hope I haven't lost you. What we're saying is that when God says he expects us to have the faith of Jesus, the only way, remember the question that we asked, how can you have the faith of someone else? The only way someone can express the faith or a faith that is someone else's is if that person has a character of that someone else's faith. Does that make sense? The only way that I can express his faith is if I have a character that is his. So the, re the, the only way that his people are going to have his faith or the faith of Jesus is if the mystery of God is fulfilled in their hearts or if Christ is developed in their hearts. Make sense? Therefore, the mystery of godliness and the faith of Jesus are the same thing. So, when Christ says that he is looking and he is seeing a people that have the faith of Jesus, in many ways what he is saying is he is looking down and he is seeing a people that have his character. Because these people, remember, they also keep the commandments of God. You can only keep the commandments of God at least the way that they are supposed to be kept if you have his character. So our work in these last days is to develop a character that reflects the character of God. Um, Ellen White, in the book Early Writings, had this to say. In a view or in a vision given on June 27, 1815, my accompanying angel said, time is almost finished. Do you reflect the lovely image of Jesus as you should? Then I was pointed to the earth and saw that there would have to be a getting ready amongst those who have of late embraced the third angel's message. Say the angel, get ready, get ready, get ready. You will have to die a greater death to the world than you have ever died. I saw that there was a great work to do for them and but little time in which to do it. So Ellen White, through this vision, he sees that in 1850, as early as 1850, the angel is saying, time is almost finished. Are you developing the character that you're supposed to develop. And then he says, there is a great work that is going to have to be done, but there is little time. And this was in 1850. How, how long ago is 1850? That's at least, I don't know, 100, I don't know how many years, but that's a long time back. If this angel was to say what he said today, I don't know how much time you, you quantify because when he was quantifying the time in 1850, he said there is little time for us to do the work that we have to do, but there is a lot of work that needs to be done. The work that needs to be done is the development of a Christ-like character in our hearts. The title of my sermon was O ye of little faith. Now, in the book uh, of Matthew, there's a very familiar story. Um, it's where Christ and his disciples are on the sea. And the Christ, I don't know if he was tired, he, he sleeps. So he's asleep, and you know, there's a storm that starts on the sea. Now, I've never been in a storm before, 
on the sea. But generally, I don't like maths. I don't like being on, 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 on water, even if it's calm. Now, I can only imagine. <laughs> I might not want to <laughs> like being on water, the area is laughing. But um, I can only imagine um, how it, it should be like being on sea and the waves and the sea and the boat is tossing to and from. And the panic that should have been in that boat. Because the people, this, most of Christ, remember most of Christ's disciples were what? Fishermen. They knew the sea, they had sailed those seas before. I'm sure they have made storms before in their careers. But even those disciples were afraid. They, 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 they thought they were going to die. So you can, you can imagine how, how scary it must have been for, you know. But Christ was asleep. Somehow, Christ was sleeping. Maybe, let's just say he was too tired, maybe. But he was asleep. Even as the boy is shaking to and fro, he was sleeping. And then these disciples that tried whatever they knew, whatever experiences that they had, you know, from the years of sailing in these seas, trying to do this, trying to do that, it's not working. They are afraid here, still sleeping. And then they um, this we are going to die. Master, turning to Jesus. Master, master. And then the disciples asked Christ a question. Do you not care? Do you not care that we perish? That's the question. If you, if you, we don't understand, but if you go to, to Matthew, you find um, it's Matthew, I believe it's Matthew 4, sorry. Anyway, sorry, I did, I did not write down the, the reference to, to the story. But if he says, do you not care that we perish? So Christ is up. Now, this is how I've always envisioned this story, and maybe I'm not alone. Because maybe growing up, I watched you know, those movies, uh, uh, Jesus movies. I think that's how it's portrayed in the movie. This is what I've always thought. When Christ woke up, he turned to the sea and rebuked the sea. And the sea was calm. And then when the sea was calm, he turned to the disciples and told them, O ye of little faith, why were you afraid? That's, I mean, that's, when you think about it, that's the logical way of doing it. I mean, people are panicking. You need to at least, first of all, address the thing that is making the people panic, right? That makes sense. And then maybe you have other ways. You can now, when people have, have calmed down and, you know, everyone is okay, then you can now address them to whatever you want to address them. But if you read Matthew, you find that that's not the order, at least that Matthew records it in. Matthew says that when Christ arose from his sleep, he first of all addressed the disciples. So he turned to the disciples and said, like, I don't even understand how this was happening, but this is in the midst of the sea thing, you're training upside down, and Christ has the time to say, Oh, you of little faith, why are you afraid? And then he turns to the sea, and then he comes to the sea. Why did Christ feel the need of addressing the disciples' faith first before coming to the sea. The answer that I got as I was thinking about that was when Christ woke up, he saw that in the hearts of the disciples, although there was, although there was an actual sea going on around them, but there was another, not sea, storm, there was another storm that was raging in the hearts of the disciples. And that storm was more deadly than the actual storm that was around them. So Christ felt the need to calm that storm first. He saw that even if I calm this storm and I leave this storm and calm, these people will still perish. So let me calm that storm first. And the storm that Christ saw was that the disciples had no faith. Now, I was asking myself, what faith? You are about to die. What else should you do? Like, in that situation, what else should you do? You are about to die. What faith is Christ talking about here? But remember, before, what was Christ doing? Sorry, I can't hear you. What was Christ doing? Christ was asleep. He had to be 
wake up. If he had to be woken up, that means he was in deep sleep. How was Christ able to sleep in the midst of that storm? So, I, 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 used, I still do, I, I, I like to watch movies. So, in movies, when you have, when you have maybe three part series of movies, part one, part two, part three, and then you have an actor, maybe it's the main actor, let's just say it's the main actor, you know that this main actor, you're watching the first part, right? And you know that this main actor needs to be in the third movie. You understand? Because it's the main, I mean, you've seen the poster of the third act, of the third movie, or you've seen the trailer or whatever. So you know that this actor here, he's supposed to be in that movie, I'm watching the first one. Now, the actor is in a, in a, in a situation where he's with the bad guy, he's about to be killed, or, you know, he's being beaten down. For me, when I'm in that situation, as long as I know that this person is in the third movie, I'm okay. Like, you know that somehow, he's going to find a way. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, you are, you are okay, you, you don't stress. Ah, yeah, you, know, you find your way. He, he, because you know, inside your heart, that this guy cannot die here. If he dies here, then how is he in the same movie? You know? So you have that trust, like, he's not going to die. That concept is what was happening in the mind of Christ. When he was on that sea, he knew that all of what I call it, even though there's a storm, or even if the boat turned upside down, I am not going to die. You know why? Because God the Father sent me here to die on the cross. There is no cross here. How will I die? Do you understand? There is no cross in this sea. I can't die. And God is going to figure out a way to rescue me from this sea. Because I have to be in Gethsemane. So he knew the end of the story. So he knew there was no way he could die. So he was able to sleep. So said, okay, let's talk. Okay, I'll sleep. In other words, God or Christ had so much faith in his God, in in God the Father, that he was able to sleep. On the other hand, the disciples did not know the whole story. That's why they were freaking out. So when Christ wakes up, he sees in them, oh, these people don't have my faith. The faith of Jesus that we're talking about. So he addresses them first. Because he knows that if he leaves that faith or faithlessness and change, even if he comes to see, the next time they're in a different situation, without that same faith, what will happen? They'll freak out again. So he says, O ye of your faith. In other words, please have faith, the same faith that I have. Have it. And you'll have peace. And then he comes you know, whatever was freaking them out. And, well, and as I was thinking about that, in fact, if you go on and then you try you track down the, the disciples, Christ has gone back to heaven, and then the church is being persecuted. And then you see the life of Peter. Peter was one of the disciples that was in that boat. And knowing Peter, I'm sure he was on the top of the of the whole incident. Maybe it was the one that was even, I don't know, I didn't read. It could even be the person who was saying, Master, do you not care? Just knowing Peter's character. But if you trace Peter's life in the book of Acts, Peter is captured and then he's in prison. And the sentence that he has is that he's going to be beheaded. You know that story, right? It's going to be beheaded the following day. <laughs> now, again, I've never been taught that I'll be beheaded the, the, the following day. But I'm just imagining that if I was taught that, uh, love more, next morning, first thing, we're cutting off your head. I don't know what I would be doing in that night, but I most certainly know that I would not be sleeping. Or maybe my friends, would you be able to sleep? I, I, I don't know, I don't think I'll have the peace, at least in my current stage. I'll be thinking of, okay, so what is going to happen with my family when I go? You know, have I set my house in order? Do they have enough? I, that's what I'll be thinking about. But, but Peter, interestingly enough, Finally, after all those years, after all those years of 
being with Christ, and then Christ is gone, he finally got the message. And when Peter is in that situation, Peter is about to be beheaded the next morning. He finds the peace to sleep, just like his master was asleep in the storm. He's completely asleep. And the church is praying for Peter. And then an angel comes. And when the angel comes, there's an earthquake. The earthquake opens the gates for the prison. Uh, in the prison. The angel comes in. And even after, okay guys, that we don't have a God. But even after an earthquake, Peter is still asleep. Peter still, <laughs> he is still asleep. The angel comes into Peter's uh, prison cell. He has to wake up Peter. Read the passage if you find time. He has to wake up Peter. Peter, Peter, let's go. Literally, he had to be waken up. That's how, that's how much peace Peter had when he was going to be beheaded the next morning. He finally got it. That it, whatever happens, the storms in our lives, and this is what we're learning uh, in, in, in the quarterly lesson. The storms in our lives show our character. In the storm is not when we develop character. In the storms of life, whatever it is, it could be, it, it, it might not even be the final storms of life that are going to come. Uh, at the end, just before uh, the seventh trumpet is blown. It might be whatever it is, financial, I don't know, whatever people are going through in their lives. Those storms, in that time, that's not the time to develop character. The character is just revealed in the storms. So, Christ's goal, Christ's is that we develop his faith. We develop his character. So that when these storms of life come, we have peace. We're able to say, it's, it, it is well, it's, it's okay. You're able to sleep. You know the verse in Philippians that says, um, do not be anxious of anything. You know, but in prayer, in everything, in prayer and supplications, leave your petitions to God. And the peace of God, that passes all understanding. That's the peace that Peter had. That's the peace that Christ had. And that's the peace that Christ wants us to have, even in the midst of our storms. And the way that we develop that character, the way that we develop that faith of Jesus, the mystery of godliness, is by beholding Christ. The memory text of our quarterly lesson, the what was it? The Church of the Living God. What was the memory text of our of our quarterly lesson? Holding the image, mm. the mirror, to become transformed mm. into that image. Exactly. By beholding Christ were transformed from glory to what? To glory. And we behold Christ by spending time in his word. We behold Christ by spending time in prayer. When, when some of these things, when they're saying maybe in, in isolation, they don't make sense. When, 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 we are, when we are taught to spend time in prayer, when we are um, encouraged to spend time in the word, Maybe it does not make sense in isolation, but put it in this context, that if we do not spend time in prayer, if we do not spend time uh, in the study of God's word, then we are saying that we do not want to develop, or we are disabling ourselves to develop this character. And it is only by developing this character that we will be able to pass through the storms that are coming. So may, may that context give us encouragement to spend more time in God's word, to spend more time with Christ. And it is by beholding Christ that we are changed into his image from glory to glory. And that when the seventh trumpet 
finally sounds as the king will be coming. Christ would have, would have found us fully ready, developed his character, ready for heaven. Because without that character, we will not go to heaven. It's, it's as simple as that. I, I, I know it's, it sounds mean, it sounds harsh, but it's not going to happen. If we don't develop the character and the seventh trumpet sounds, we are not going to heaven. And it is going to be out of mercy that God restrains us from heaven. Because we are not going to like heaven if we don't have his character. Ellen White, in, Christ, in, in terms of Christ, says, the sinner would rather, he would, he is going to ask God, would ask God to kill him if, if God allowed the sinner to enter into heaven with his sin and with his character. Just the environment there and seeing what is happening there, the sinner would ask God to kill him. Because it would be torture for a sinner in his sin, in his sinfulness, to be in heaven. So we need that character. We need to spend time in God's word. May God bless the reading and sharing of His word. Amen. Amen. In closing, we will make use of uh, him uh, 3267. Rescue the perishing.